And there is no God beside him, the Sovereign, the Holy One, the source of peace, the bestower of security, the protector, the mighty, the subduer, the exalted. Holy is Allah, far above that which they associate with him. Hazrat Amirul Mu'mineen Adullah Ta'ala bin Israel Aziz has been reminding us and the world at large time and time again that the primary cause of the problems faced by humanity at this stage is because they are distancing themselves from their creator. These problems may be in the form of social issues in our society political problems, like the wars going on around us, economic issues experienced even in the most affluent of the nations, or a lack of peace experienced at an individual level. Hazuri Akdis, as Allah Ta'ala bin Israel Aziz, has explained that true peace can only be achieved if mankind restores its energy towards God and his teachings. The gap between people and God is apparent in many ways. Materialism is increasingly the driving force for running our societies. Lack of justice is leading to widespread suffering and severe weather changes are increasing due to our greedy interference with our climate. The world requires to reflect on the direction it is heading before we end up causing a major disaster for ourselves. This is the challenge faced by us in our tabligh activity these days. How to help people bring back their attention and improve their relationship with Allah and therefore consequently find solutions to our problems instead of causing them to keep worsening. The challenge is constantly increasing in its magnitude. If we compare the UK population census of 2001 and 2011, people who call themselves as Christians or practicing Christians decreased from around 70% to 45%, meaning that less than half of the population of this country now claims to be practicing any faith. At the same time, people who call themselves either of no religion or no belief increased from 15 to 25%, meaning that a minimum of a quarter of the population of the country openly declares that they have no faith in any religion or God. And this shift away from religion is spreading worldwide. Painfully, even in the Muslim countries like Indonesia, Pakistan, Middle East, or Egypt. So firstly, 
let us look at some common arguments that are used by atheists to suggest non-existence of God. It is hard for people to give up their habit of pleasure seeking and they give it the name of freedom. We know that discipline is essential for any kind of growth. If an athlete needs to win a gold medal, he needs to live a life of discipline with practice, diet control, sleep management before he will achieve his aim. The principle of need of discipline applies to all aspects of our lives, including the need of our moral and spiritual development. Belief in God and building up relationship with God requires a life of intense discipline, and this is hard for many. Another question that's commonly raised is that if there is a compassionate God, why is there so much suffering in the world? Firstly, we need to remember that suffering does not have an independent existence in our lives. Darkness does not have its independent existence. It is the absence of light that is called darkness. In the same way, suffering is the name that our psyche gives to a relative reduction in a sense of pleasure or pleasantness. Hence, it is a matter of looking at those less fortunate than us, and our sense of suffering changes altogether. An example usually given is of the so-called natural disasters. For example, hurricanes and typhoons, they are occurring with increasing frequency these days. They are, in fact, Earth's refrigerators. Massive amount of evaporation of seawater leads to cooling down of the temperature of the sea and therefore enables preservation of food stored in the sea. This food is one of the initial links in the food chain that ultimately helps survival of all life forms on Earth, including life on land and including humans. Similarly, jungle fire restores carbon-enriched soil for stronger plants to grow. Gene mutations that are responsible for some birth defects and illnesses are in fact strengthening the species through evolutionary changes. All these phenomena may be seen as having some destructive effect within a limited sphere, but in fact they're playing a hugely constructive role in the overall scheme of natural occurrence. Another argument quoted by non-believers to suggest non-existence of God is the undesirable behavior of the some who claim to follow religion. This approach has also been used by Richard Dawkins in his popular book, The God Delusion. So briefly responding to a couple of his main points, he writes, religion has led to problems for mankind. The matter of fact is that it is injustice that stems from human greed and pride that has led to problems for mankind. The two world wars were thus initiated and they were not religious wars. Acceptingly, when religious teachings are distorted or malpracticed, there can be problems. However, it is the original teachings of religion that have always been the solution of the same problems. Therefore, we need to distinguish carefully between the original teachings of religion and the distortions. Dawkins also writes, progress of man is not linked to religion. However, when we study the history, it tells us that progress and decline of a society depends on how much it follows the principles like justice, honesty, freedom of conscience, equality, right of others. 
these principles are in fact fundamental teachings of religion. Dawkins has tried to present his argue, uh, belief in God as a delusion, when in fact his own arguments don't go deep enough to study religion with an open mind. To me, it is more a case of an illusion of the God delusion. After this quick analysis, we can now look at some arguments that evidence the existence of God. I've divided this into three stages. Arguments that make the existence of God more likely, then arguments that cannot be explained other than by the existence of God, and finally, the argument that takes anyone beyond any doubt that there is a God. Firstly, the arguments that make the existence of God more likely. In this section, even though some of the arguments have been derived from the Holy Quran and the writings of the promised Messiah, but they are deliberately worded in a secular way so that they can be acceptable to our atheist tabligh guest. If we look around us, there is a universal quest with entity of God. Why should people be curious about an entity that never existed? Or is there an alternative explanation that the master creator made our psyche in a way that it should seek him? Belief in God has existed throughout human history. There's archeological and historical evidence of religious worship of a higher being in the indigenous populations of the Americas, Middle East, and Australia. This evidence dates back to much before messengers of God formally introduced the concept to us. Even today, majority of the world population believes in existence of God. There's a total population of approximately 7.5 billion, out of which two and a half billion are Christians, 1.8 billion Muslims, one billion each of Hindus and Buddhists, and then some other smaller religions. So altogether, around six and a half billion people believe in God in one form or another. Hence, the non-believer holds a view that is at odd with the majority of the view of the mankind. Human conscience provides evidence of God manifesting within us. Our inner self finds good as pleasant, while there is a natural dislike towards bad and criminal behavior. At the same time, all religions are unanimous that God teaches goodness and forbids us from bad things. Therefore, we see that our instincts and our natural occurrence is in line with the teachings of God and religion. God is the entity that is the ultimate cause of all causes. All scientists look for a cause and effect in their scientific research, and they accept that they cannot take, keep taking this argument backwards indefinitely. In other words, that there must be an ultimate cause of all existence. This ultimate cause is God. Science also tells us that universe has not existed forever and that it came into being approximately 14 billion years ago. Hence, our universe must also have a cause. And that cause must be beyond the limits of time space and matter, because all these three things were formed at the time of the creation of universe. If that cause of the universe is beyond time, it means that that cause must be eternal. If it is beyond space, means that it cannot be confined to the limits of space and that it's present everywhere and beyond. If it is beyond matter, 
then it means that its form is not limited to the elements as we know it. And that means that it is difficult for us to comprehend the form of that ultimate cause. That is what religion tells us about God already, even before science got to these arguments. And the atheistic view that there is no creator of the universe implies that either the universe had always existed or that it came into existence by itself. And both these implications are in contradiction to the scientific viewpoint. Another point that supports the idea of existence of God is that intelligent creation does not come out of chance happenings. Even when an archaeologist discovers a broken pot at a site where they're digging, it confirms to them that there was a maker sometimes in the history at that point. The universe, with a complex and balanced system of natural laws, functioning flawlessly, would in the same way require the presence of an intelligent creator. Fred Hoyle, an eminent British scientist, in his book, The Intelligent Universe, describes the idea of the universe coming into existence by chance, the same as saying that wind blew through a scrapyard and a jumbo jet was created by chance. Works of Neil Bohr and Max Planz, two Nobel laureate scientists of the 20th century, came out with the quantum theory of particle physics. Briefly speaking, the theory implies that an organized universe and conscious life is, can only have come out of some kind of consciousness present beforehand. Once our atheist tablique guest has accepted the point, we can then move on to the second stage of arguments that cannot be explained other than by existence of God. God who not only created us, but maintains his interest in our well-being and progress. These arguments would now refer to religious sources. First one is looking at the testimony given by the most truthful of people known to mankind. Who do we trust the most? The politicians, the, the story writers, the sociologists, maybe, scientists, maybe a bit more. But it is a well-established fact that the messengers of God have had the highest standards of moral dignity and truthfulness. And there is no exception to this rule. If we then observe a common theme in the teachings of all messengers, is it not likely to be the truth? All messengers claim that there is one God and that they work under his guidance. Similarly, looking at life histories of all messengers, we find another amazing evidence for existence of God. They're virtually alone when they make the initial claim, and they're usually very weak in worldly resources compared to their adversaries. They face strong persecution at the hands of the opposition. How do messengers respond? By incredible patience, prayer, and forgiveness. And what is the result? They ultimately succeed in achieving their aim. And messengers have always claimed that they have worked under divine command and with divine support. In my humble view, life and testimony of God's messengers is the most beautiful and touching evidence of the existence of God. And above all, the Holy Quran is a miraculous piece of evidence for existence of God. Revealed 1400 years ago, it mentions knowledge of various domains, including various sciences, history, economics, politics, and it makes prophecies about the future. 
Many aspects of this knowledge have now been discovered to be true, and prophecies come true with amazing accuracy. Where does this, where does this knowledge come from? On one hand, it was clearly beyond the scope of human scholarship at the time of its revelation. And on the other, the holy recipient, Prophet Muhammad wasallam, claimed that he's only a messenger, that he received it from God. This claim not only just proves strong evidence for existence of God, but also that God communicates with the human being. And finally, moving on to an argument that takes one beyond doubt that there is a God, promised Messiah Islam writes in the philosophy of teachings of Islam that knowledge is based on three stages of certainty, of evidence, of witness, and of personal experience. An example of evidence is the manifestations of God that we see in all the creation and that leads us to the ultimate cause. Witnessing God in action and is the witnessing of the Quranic principles manifesting in our lives, particularly in the lives of messengers of God. However, the most definite of all forms of knowledge of certainty is achieved by one's experience of God. What doubt would remain in a person once they have personally experienced communication with their creator, or they achieve through prayer what was otherwise beyond their individual ab ability. <coughs> the Holy Quran has taught us how to develop this communication with God. It is through persistent prayer whilst living a life of moral discipline. May Allah enable us to constantly improve our own spiritual standards, our personal relationship with Allah the Almighty, and then also help the ailing mankind change their focus towards God.